The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, the epic battle of Midway. The Japanese are playing something bigger. Now, a major motion picture. It's a great underdog tale. Then, ambushed. I should have died in Vietnam. A soldier is hopelessly outnumbered. I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that something very, very, very bad was going to happen. Plus, Marilyn Hickey looks back at her world-changing ministry on today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club. The ceasefire in Syria, well, it's not happening, and it never has. The killing continues in the death zone as the Free Syrian Army unleashes its reign of terror. Girls are being mutilated, civilians tortured and killed, and families driven from their homes. What are United States senators now demanding be done? Chris Mitchell reports. Dave Eubank of the Free Burma Rangers remains on the front lines and tells CBN News what he's seen and heard. There's been constant fighting since the invasion. There's never been a ceasefire, not one day. Airstrikes by drones, regular airstrikes, artillery, mortars, Turkish tanks, I mean, shooting right at us. He says the U.S. exit left a vacuum on the battlefield. Once we step back, boom, here came the Turks and the Free Syrian Army, most of whom were jihadis and they fled and ran for their lives, over 300,000. Massive ethnic cleansing that now America is part of. And it's not completely genocide because no one's hanging out to find out they're gonna get killed. Eubank has watched Turkey's NATO army work side by side with virtual terrorists. The Free Syrian Army is a wicked force unleashing terror. We've seen them mutilate girls, torture civilians, yell Alu Akbar just like we saw ISIS do against us. So I would say they're a wicked scourge being used by Erdogan to torment the people here. And they've got to be stopped. He accuses them of committing war crimes. Oh, yes. Killing prisoners, killing civilians, chasing people out of their homes, torture. Definitely. A top U.S. diplomat agrees, writing in this internal memo, Turkey's military operation in northern Syria spearheaded by armed Islamist groups on its payroll, represents what can only be described as war crimes and ethnic cleansing. On Capitol Hill, five U.S. senators want straight answers from Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. In this letter, they asked Pompeo if reports that Turkey and Turkish-backed forces are operating outside the agreed-upon safe zone are true and ask that the administration take immediate action against Turkey if these reports are true. Erdogan really is an Ottomanist. He wants to come and expand his uh, empire. Juliana Tamarazi is an so Assyrian Christian who sees history repeating Ottoman. itself in Erdogan's so-called safe zone. We have to look at what the Ottoman Empire did to the Christian community in the region, in ancient Mesopotamia. Um, and really stop that from progressing. They wanted to Islamify and Turkify the entire Christian community in Turkey. Tamarazi sees the Turkish invasion as one more blow to Middle East Christianity. The dwindling number of Christians in the region is really should be shocking to the Westerners. Radical Islam will be on the rise because there is no buffer between the Islamic East and the Christian West. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Now, this is a story you're not going to see elsewhere, but we're here to report it to you. Uh, anyone saying that there's been a ceasefire, no, there hasn't been a ceasefire. This is an ethnic cleansing. This is assertion of control over a portion of Syria by Turkey. Uh, they want to re reinvigorate, if you will, the Ottoman Empire. And all you have to do is go back to right before World War I. That's, you know, just a hundred years ago. Uh, they had control of all of it. They had control of Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Israel, Lebanon. They had control of all of it. Erdogan wants to reassert that, and he wants to do it and make it a Muslim state. Uh, that's his goal. And when this army got unleashed in, in Syria, they called it the Army of Muhammad. Uh, this isn't just a, you know, a sports team nickname. This is they are on a jihad. 
uh, and they're aligning themselves with jihadists. So we're seeing ethnic cleansing, uh, we're seeing genocide, and we're seeing yet another refugee crisis come out of Syria. And it's all because we decided to pull out. Well, in other news, here at home, it looks like the Democratic presidential race could soon be shaken up. Ephraim Graham has that story from the CBN Newsroom. Ephraim? Gordon, the Democrats may have a new candidate. Former New York City mayor and multi-billionaire Michael Bloomberg is signaling he might run. As Jennifer Wishon now reports, that could scramble the Democrats' primary race. Can the current field of Democrats running for president beat Donald Trump? That's the big question many prominent Democrats are asking. Former Mayor Michael Bloomberg isn't convinced they can. Now he's opening the door for his own shot. I've been a Democrat, I've been a Republican, and I eventually became an independent. For weeks, the 77-year-old has been talking with influential Democrats expressing concerns about the steadiness of Joe Biden's campaign and the rise of left-wing senators Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. A longtime critic of President Trump, now Bloomberg is taking steps to get his name on the Alabama primary ballot. A top advisor says Bloomberg considers the president an unprecedented threat to our nation and says Mike is increasingly concerned that the current field of candidates is not well positioned to defeat him. Trump is a risky, reckless and radical choice. Bloomberg has dedicated his influence and some of his fortune to promoting gun control and climate change initiatives. As a moderate, he would pose a threat to Biden, but his deep ties to Wall Street could motivate loyal supporters of Warren and Sanders, who likely wouldn't take well to a billionaire blocking their agenda. And he'd have an uphill battle winning over the party's powerful black constituency after defending the New York Police Department's controversial stop and frisk policy, criticized as unfairly targeting African-Americans and Hispanics. And Bloomberg's move comes as polling shows the president remains very strong in key swing states needed to win the Electoral College. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. Jennifer, thank you. The Texas boy caught in the middle of a bitter custody battle that made national headlines when it was re revealed his mother wanted to transition him into a girl is now attending school as a boy. The Save James Facebook page posted photos of seven-year-old James Younger and his brother Jude before they headed off for school. The page also posted a photo of Jeff Younger standing with his two sons. Friends of the Younger family said in a post, Jeff emailed the principal today and James and Jude's teachers are, have reported there was zero stress or disruption in the classroom today. Just another day in school. Prayers answered. Christian music charts have a new voice in the top spot. Kanye West is shaking things up with his first faith-based album, Jesus is King. Abigail Robertson brings us more on the impact faith is having on this megastar and on people all across the country. The gospel album, Jesus is King, is hitting number one across the major music genres, with each song landing in Billboard's Hot 100. Kanye is openly sharing his radical faith transformation and helping to lead thousands to Christ in the process. Kanye West works for God. Kanye recently telling CBS's James Corden it was Christians in his life who never stopped praying, who made all the difference. You know, there's a lot of people that were praying for me when I was, you know, all the way gone, when I was on the, you know, at the MTV Awards holding a Hennessy bottle, running on stage, when I was, uh, you know, doing creative direction for certain award shows. And it was people in my family that were praying for me. Kanye admits to dealing with addictions like sex and pornography and believes sharing these life struggles makes him more relatable to non-believers exploring faith. God's always had a plan for me and he always wanted to use me, but I think he wanted me to suffer more and wanted people to see my suffering and see my pain and put stigmas and on me and have me go through all the experiences, the human experiences. So now when I talk about how Jesus saved me, more people can relate to that experience. He also encouraged those working on his album to refrain from things like premarital sex and join him in fasting and praying. His calling is to evangelize the world. So he has some great people speaking in his life, but he needs more. So we need to pray for him. 
Minister Sean Bowles, who attended one of Kanye's recent Sunday services, tells CBN News it's important to remember the music star is a relatively new convert and Christians should give him time as he publicly goes through this process. There was probably over 2,000 people who came to Christ just at Kanye's service while we were there who raised their hands for salvation. And there's people en masse. There's so many churches in L.A. that are popping in into an entertainment culture to believe in God's dream for what he wants to do. And so I think that we're about to see a tipping point and that where popular culture goes, all culture goes. So God is at the head of this thing, and I'm excited. Corey Robertson of Duck Dynasty fame took her family to a Sunday service in Baton Rouge. It was a straight up worship experience and um, we loved it. Adding Christians should be the first ones celebrating what's happening. This is what we pray for. This is what we hope for, for Jesus to come into someone's life and just have a, a absolute 180 degree life change. Christian rapper Lecrae tells CBN News he believes Kanye is sincere. At this juncture in time, I believe he's compelled to tell people about Jesus. I believe he's compelled to say, I found a new faith and I'm serious about it. In addition to those coming to the Lord at his concerts, Google is seeing a spike in searches for scripture passages and biblical phrases found in Kanye's lyrics. Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Can't be mad at that. Gordon? No, you can't, and it's wonderful. For those of us who have been praying for revival in America, let us rejoice. What a wonderful thing to happen for someone with this kind of platform uh, to be straight up gospel and, and no holds barred, not trying to have you know, some kind of you know, sweet message, but hey, if, if you're involved in these things, you're a sinner and you need to repent and you need to turn. And I did, and this is what I found, and this is where I am today. What a wonderful witness. That's what we're called to do, to be witnesses of how Jesus can change our lives. And Kanye is saying, here's my witness. Here's where I was. You knew it. Uh, you saw it. It was played out on a very big stage. But now listen to me. This is what Jesus has done for me. He's changed my life, and he will change yours, too, if you just give him a chance. What a wonderful message for our culture today. Let's pray for him. He's oh, on yeah. that cutting edge. <laughs> Let's pray for him. Absolutely. Well, still ahead on today's program, the battle that turned the tide in the Pacific now being told on the big screen. Meet the cast and crew behind the brand new movie, Midway. Plus, trapped in enemy territory and outnumbered by more than 15 to one. This Vietnam vet should have died in the war. So how on earth did he survive? And then later, Marilyn Hickey Live, the world traveling evangelist highlights her lifetime in ministry. It turned the tide of World War II, the battle at Midway. And now the epic story of the miracle men who fought in that conflict comes to the big screen today. Ephraim Graham brings us this behind the scenes look at Midway from Hawaii. Old photographs and newspaper clippings, memories of the miracle men of Midway who used instincts, fortitude and bravery to overcome the Imperial Japanese Navy and turn the tide of World War II in the Pacific, six months after Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor. I can cut from this image. Independence Day director Roland Emmerich brings the battle to the big screen in Midway. The situation in the Pacific is far worse than reported. Pearl Harbor is the greatest intelligence failure in American history. Reset! The Japanese are planning something bigger. So what's the target? We believe it's Midway. Washington disagrees. Washington is wrong. So you're from Germany, correct? What was it about this piece of American history that fascinated you so much? Um... I kind of saw a documentary 20 years ago, and I was just amazed how many factors in one battle have to happen. Uh, what, like, deci what decides a battle, uh, 
And I just like the, the, the richness of the whole tapestry. Emmerich uses the real-life experiences of those World War II leaders and sailors to tell this battle story. Yeah, maybe it isn't Pearl. Ed Skrine plays the role of dive bomber pilot and squadron commander Dick Best. Ed, describe Dick Best to me. Uh, he seems like quite a character. I mean, there's kind of, we see a number of Dick Best in this movie, <laughs> yeah. right? We meet him at the beginning as this, this New Jersey cocky flyboy, the type of guy who cuts out his engine um, when he's landing the, the plane just to prove to himself he can do it in case it happens in battle, you know? Um, after Pearl Harbor happens, we see, see a relentless best. We see him on a one-man mission to win the war all by himself, which we all know isn't possible. And then we see a fragile best, you know, a, a, a lost best, um, where he loses his confidence and this bravado, um, you know, due to fatalities and losses once he becomes a leader, you know. And, and, and after that, we see him with the help of his best friend, Clarence Dickinson, played so brilliantly by Luke. He gains this emotional intelligence, this emotional literacy, and becomes the leader that um, perhaps he was born to be and, and, and that um, his team needed. Now, Luke, you play Clarence. I understand you actually paid a visit to his grave in Hawaii. I did. What made yeah. you do that? I just, you know, I was here. We were filming in Hawaii for two weeks, and I felt, I just felt it was uh, my duty to do that, you know? Um, I don't know the man personally, and I don't know any of his family members, but I just wanted to pay my respects to him, and hopefully he's looking down upon me, giving me his, his approval, you know? So I just wanted to say thank you. And best, I'm bumping you up from XO. Dennis Quaid is Fleet Admiral William Bull Halsey. There's another rumor that your life may be in danger. Patrick Wilson is intelligence officer Edwin Layton. For both of you, what would you say your characters taught you for you? What did Bill Halsey teach you for you? What did Edwin Layton teach you? The dedication, the passion, the, the service to your country is something that uh, that that I don't that doesn't go unnoticed. I think mm. by us and by a lot of uh, a lot of people that don't get the opportunity. Anytime you're you, it's 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 country over over politics. It's uh, it's page. That's what patriotism is. It's certainly not about. Um, Washington. It's, it's about this man to man relationship. Yeah, I think it's a good reminder that there were times, and there still can't be still times, mm -hmm. when our country is a united country in spite of differences of opinion and all the rest of it. We got the order to launch. We need to throw a punch so they know what it feels like to be hit. We're talking about a couple dozen planes. It's all Japanese fleet. This isn't a fair fight. Your thoughts on both of you, just the story itself. I mean, reading about it and history to know that these men were outgunned, outmanned. I mean, six months earlier, and then they managed to pull this off. The war is chaos. You know, it's absolute chaos. And uh, I guess what's really inspiring is that, you know, with the sheer unpredictability of so much, you still have people showing up. I don't know how to lead these men. They'll follow you anywhere. You know that you came through when people are counting on you. You'll be able to face anything. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, Honolulu, Hawaii. Well, if you've ever read military history, you know the significance of this battle. It was an absolute turning point in the Pacific War, the war against Japan. Uh, if it hadn't been for uh, this miracle victory, and it was a miracle victory, uh, the outcome of the war hung in the balance, and, and we could be living in a completely different world today. Uh, so if you want to know this history, Midway opens in theaters across the country today. You can find out where it's playing by going to CBNNews.com. And in addition to seeing the movie and, and finding out the history, uh, take some time to greet a veteran today and, and tell them thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for what you've done uh, for America and how you've given us these freedoms that we have today. It was their sacrifice that made all the difference. Ter? Yeah, that, that sacrificial cord that's in so many is, is just so to be admired. I yeah. mean, you don't see that. Country above yeah. politics. Ooh, yeah.
Amen. We, we could use a dose of that today. Absolutely. Well, from World War II to Vietnam, up next, a combat vet remembers a vicious firefight, the hail of bullets that surrounded him and his narrow brush with death. Plus, she smuggled Bibles into communist Vietnam and spread the gospel in more than 100 other countries. Marilyn Hickey joins the, or shares the incredible stories from her nearly 50 years of ministry. You don't want to miss it, so don't go away. William Whitmore had a bad feeling that something terrible was about to happen. And in January of 1968, those fears came true. William was fighting in Vietnam when he and his company were ambushed. While he lived to see another day, other members of his platoon perished. And that haunted William for more than 40 years. By all rights, I should not be sitting here talking to you. I should have died in Vietnam. William Whitmore of Virginia Beach, Virginia, is a 72-year-old semi-retired insurance agent. He's also a Vietnam veteran. In early 1966, at age 18, he walked into an Army recruiter's office and volunteered to go to war. I wanted to defend the United States of America, fight for it, and that was my sole motivation. That sense of duty and patriotism was inspired by his dad. He was a bombardier on the B-17s flying in the European theater. I loved my father. I was very, very proud of my father. And all I ever wanted to do in my life was have him be proud of me. But it was his mom who made sure her children were in church and inspired William to give his life to Jesus when he was 13. But like many teenagers, his focus soon drifted to other things and away from God. Was he first on my list when I woke up in the morning? Absolutely not. I was. 17 years old and just and being a typical 17 year old. By June of 67, William was fighting in the jungles of South Vietnam. It was like 105, 110 degrees and the humidity was 100 plus and it was absolutely stifling. And then all of a sudden you're hearing lead flying all over and gunshots being exchanged. There's an adrenaline rush it's hard for me to put into words so that another civilian would understand exactly what a firefight is like. Are you in fear of possibly dying? Yeah, but is that all you're thinking about? Absolutely not. There's a brotherhood that is formed once you're in combat. Out of all his harrowing combat experiences, the one William remembers most came while he was on patrol on January 24, 1968, just six days before North Vietnam's famous Tet Offensive. I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that something very, very, very bad was getting ready to happen. William's company of 126 men was ambushed by a force of 2,000. And the opening burst took out half the platoon. The sound was absolutely horrifying. And as I'm running and firing, I feel this very heavy hand on my right shoulder. I was pushed to the ground. As I'm going down, I feel something burning in the back of my neck. That burning was a bullet. The hole in his bandolier that he still has today shows just how close he was to death. There's no doubt in my mind that was the hand of God pushing me to the ground. If I had not gone to the ground, I would not be sitting here talking with you. Many of William's comrades fell during the firefight. One of them was his best friend, John. I wrestled with that for over 51 years. John was a great guy. Everybody loved him. Great leader, married, happy family. And I'm asking God, I am a nobody. Why did you decide to take him and leave me? A few months later, William went home. But that question and the horrific memories would plague him for decades, causing nightmares and paranoia, all of which he kept to himself. So he pressed on, became a police officer, married, and started a family. He also joined a church. But it would take 10 years for him to realize what it meant to truly follow Christ. I had the, the very stark realization that I had given my life to 
to God. But as William, I had never surrendered all of my life. So in tears and in prayer, I surrendered my life in its entirety to the Lord. I said, I'm yours, 100%. But even as William began living his life for Christ, his mind was still troubled by the haunting memories. Then in 2012, more than 40 years after leaving the battlefield, William took the advice of some fellow veterans who urged him to get help. And they said, you have not only got PTSD, you have got severe PTSD. The pressure of having survived what I went through, okay, and not thinking about it, not talking about it, not opening up about it, it literally became a time bomb inside of me. With long-term therapy, the wounds of the past began to heal. Then more healing would come when William went on an honor flight trip in 2018, where volunteers take veterans to Washington, D.C. to remember and honor their service. When I came home from Nam, I was called a murderer, a baby killer, that I had caused the war. But to go on the honor flight, and to be treated the way we were treated. Literally took your breath away. It was also a time to honor and remember the fallen. William found his buddy John's name on the Vietnam War Memorial. I was able to apologize and tell him how sorry I was that he had been taken. I said, I want to say goodbye and thank you for all that you did. And I stepped back and I saluted. On Veterans Day and every day, William encourages all of us to express appreciation to those who have served our country. The best thing he can do for us is to say thank you, but to genuinely mean it from the heart. I don't know that any of us can ever really understand what it was like for those who fought in Vietnam, but we surely can say thank you. Thank you for your bravery. Thank you for your steadfastness. Thank you for really the, the privilege of watching you come back and, and become a part of the America that you made strong. And so we do say thank you to our veterans today. And, uh, you know, I think there are still so many men like William who are working through some of the things that happened to them over there, and we need to give them the grace and the space to do that. What a wonderful opportunity we have today to say, you made a difference. Yeah, and say from the heart, thank you. Uh, and if you're a veteran and, and you're still being haunted by uh, the war, the combat, the lost loved ones, the lost friends that you, that you saw, and you, you have the same questions, well, realize that there is help available to you. You don't have to stuff this down. You don't have to try to push it away. You can, through therapy, through talk therapy, through the groups that are available to you, you can get free and get to a point where uh, you, you can say, just like Sam did, that you, you, you've got, you've got a, a way out. So uh, you can do that. Um, and I encourage you to find resources. There are plenty available. Well, we've got another couple who have hearts to serve, and that's why Austin is in the Marines and why they both volunteer at their church. So when this military couple fell on hard times, CBN was there to help them out. It takes just a few minutes with Austin and Samantha to realize they love volunteering at their pillar church in Oceanside, California. Austin is a U.S. Marine, and Sam feels he balances responsibilities at work and church extremely well. I'm proud to see the work that he does for the Marine Corps, but then it also makes me proud to see what he does with Pillar and with the children. As newlyweds, the couple has been on a strict budget. Their first apartment didn't have much furniture, but they decided to put off buying any until Sam got a job at Austin's new assignment at Camp Pendleton. We'll be able to manage. Things may be tight for a little while, but we should be okay. Their enthusiasm waned when Sam didn't land a job as quickly as expected. They started dipping into what little savings they had to get by. And it was a little bit stressful seeing money kind of disappear, even though knowing we're supposed to give it all to God and let it go. 
Pillar Church asked CBN's Helping the Homefront to step in. Pastor Trace Martinez invited the couple over to tell them CBM was paying three months of car payments and rent to relieve some pressure. 90 days, no car payment, no rent payment, all of that going to what you guys need to get you taken care of, established, going into your lives together in the right way. That's just going to be so helpful. Pastor Trace also told them CBN was buying them new furniture and Ashley Furniture Store was donating some too. So they're actually going to donate an entire bedroom newlywed suite, furniture for your entire room, bed, dressers, everything. <laughs> That's exciting. I was not expecting. <laughs> <laughs> The couple headed to Ashley Furniture to buy what they needed for their home and pick out their bedroom set that Ashley's donated. Soon, Sam landed a job working in retail, relieving their financial pressure. God has been faithful through CBN and Pillar, and I'm just overwhelmed. Thank you. If you're a member of the 700 Club, thank you, because you're part of helping that wonderful family. Uh, we have this tremendous program called Helping the Home Front, where we reach out to active duty families. We recognize that they're serving too, and it's all part of what we do here at CBN. So when you join the 700 Club, you're part of all of it. It's easy to do that. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. Say, I want to be a member. How much is it? Well, it's just $20 a month. That's 65 cents a day. Some of you can join at higher levels. We have 700 Club Gold at $40 a month. 1,000 Club, $1,000 a year. That breaks out to $84 a month. At whatever level, when you call and join the 700 Club, I want you to have this. It's called the Transforming Word. It's verses from Proverbs, verses on wisdom, favor, and anointing. It's yours when you call and say, yes, I want to be a member of the 700 Club. And if you want to designate your gift to Helping the Home Front, that's easy to do. You can write us at CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. You can call us and say, I want to give to Helping the Home Front. Or you can go to the website, cbn.com. There's a place on the giving page where you can designate your gift to Helping the Home Front. And then we've got something new if you want to text to give. Uh, there's all kinds of new things, new devices, and these uh, text from a mobile phone, just text home front, uh, type that into the text message and text it to 71777 and a giving page will come up so you can designate your gift to helping the home front. Either way, do it now. 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, still to come, it's not over until you win. Marilyn Hickey says that's one of the most important lessons she's learned in almost 50 years of ministry. Her remarkable stories, it's all coming up, so don't go away. Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. More cold weather is on the way early next week with wind chills below zero expected in the upper Midwest and in the teens in parts of Texas and Mississippi. That will come after a storm this week brought cold temperatures and up to six inches of snow in the Midwest before moving into the east, leading to treacherous driving and closing one interstate in Wisconsin for hours. CBN's Operation Blessing is providing clean water to those desperately in need. Children in the community of Machiquitos Chacleros, Guatemala, were forced to walk an hour in the hot sun just for a drink of water from a contaminated river. One child said he got a stomach ache from the water one day and his parents had to take him to the hospital. Thankfully, because of support from its faithful partners, Operation Blessing was able to build a brand new water system right next to the local school. Now those children can drink clean, fresh water whenever they want, and they're grateful to Operation Blessing and its partners. You can learn more about Operation Blessing by going to its website, ob.org. Gordon and Terry are back with more of today's 700 Club right after this. From the moment she felt the call to ministry, Marilyn Hickey faced roadblocks, most of them because she was a woman. 
And yet she persevered. And nearly a half century later, she's still going strong. Marilyn Hickey is a groundbreaking minister and humanitarian who has never allowed closed doors or difficulties to stop her in her quest to share the gospel. She has traveled to over 137 countries, some of the most dangerous and darkest places of the world, reaching underground churches in nations closed to the gospel. In her book, It's Not Over Until You Win, Marilyn shares the amazing accounts of God's faithfulness in her life and encourages you to hang on to your God-given visions and passions. Well, joining us now for more is Marilyn Hickey, and we welcome you back to the 700 Thank Club. You. It's always a wonderful treat to have you here. Delightful to be here. Thank you for the open door. Well, your, your new book, It's Not Over Until You Win, is filled with so many adventures and stories. <laughs> it is just a joy to read it. But go back, if you will, with me to Vietnam, because you had a remarkable experience there smuggling Bibles. What happened? Well, in Vietnam, we got an open door to go to the rubber plantation. And so the rubber plantation was where over a thousand workers were. Wow. And so we're trying to get Bibles in to them and to get to speak to them. So how do you do it? You know, they're not saying, whoopee, here's a Christian woman yes. and she's going to teach the Bible. Yeah, they... So we took uh, an opportunity to go to Saigon and go out to the rubber plantations. I rode a motorcycle, and, <laughs> not so good, through the rubber trees. And there were a thousand people sitting on the ground. Wow. So what did I do? And there was only one light on the interpreter. So I gave salvation, baptism of the Holy Spirit, healing, miracles, everything. And then we left after two and a half hours. Our driver was waiting. And he said, uh, the police were just here and they went to get something to eat because you hadn't come out yet. Wow. So we God's came out. God's timing. Yes. <laughs> At the perfect time. Wow. Amen. You've also had such a tremendous heart for and call to the Islamic nations yes. of the world. You know, those are places that are hard to get into. And a lot of people would be fearful, I think, of making that that move. But for you, God opened doors in amazing ways. I have great favor in the Islamic world and more now because I'm older and they love old women. So <laughs> Again, God's timing. Right? I just got back from <laughs> Egypt and they come out to the meeting and healing is the dinner bell. Wow. And so we have people healed, give their testimonies and then we get follow up. Yes. So we have a sneaky way to do follow up and begin to establish churches. So let's go back to your childhood because you know there are a lot of people who are in full-time ministry and they could say, well, I was raised in the church. My mom and dad were committed believers, but that wasn't so for you. No. I mean, you really had a tough childhood in some ways. In some ways it was good. I really related to your childhood. You had many good things. Yes. But there were things that were missing as well. Well, we moved to Pennsylvania during the war. My father, you know, began to build ships. And so uh -huh. we had to live with an aunt and uncle because there was, you know, there wasn't housing. You did what you had to and do. And so yeah. this uncle, I was 11 years old, uh, and I didn't know, began to molest me. I didn't, I didn't understand. I didn't like it, but I didn't know. So that happened for almost a year. Well, and, and you said he was loved by everybody, that apart yes. from what he was doing oh, to yeah. you, he was this amazing guy that was everybody's buddy. So in a child's mind, where do you go with that? Yeah. And so I didn't, you know, I didn't understand it, but I didn't like it. Yeah. But God is so good because in all of this, we moved out. We finally had a place we could live in. And in that timing, I got born again. Yeah. And so I went to a youth camp and received Jesus as my savior. So you find Christ then, you get eventually filled with the Holy Spirit, but actually God even used that abuse in your life 40 years later. Yes, he did. And even in your heart and helping you to understand other people who've gone through such difficulties. Talk about that. Well, and it gave me something because later when all this came up, I got sick uh, yes. from being overseas. And so I began to have quite a problem and a counselors came and talked to me and this all came out. 
Wow. You know. So you'd kind of stuffed it all those four yeah, years. Yeah, I had yeah. stuffed it under all those times. And I got free from it. And so, you know, I, I, I was a pastor's wife for many years. Yes. So I have compassion for people. I want them to be free. And I think a lot of these time, things we stuff under. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we'll just let Jesus heal. And this is what the Lord said to me. I was there all the time. Yeah. You thought I wasn't there. I was there all the time. So, you know, the Word of God, what God has yeah. done for me, I feel like I'm God's pet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you are too, actually. Yeah. Talk about the whole gender issue because doors were seemingly shut to you for many, many years when you felt the call of God on your life to, to speak, to teach, to go, to minister. And you just kind of endured through all of that until one day things changed. What changed? Well, what changed is I had a wonderful husband who always yes. encouraged me and I wanted to reach the lost. And God said, if you want to reach the lost, you have to go where they are. They're not going to come to you. So I began home Bible studies. So over a cup of coffee, a cookie and a Bible, <laughs> these women yes. began to be born again. And I had like 22 home Bible studies. Wow. Then we started one at night. And that it was in that process I got into media. So really you took the door that God made available, right. small right. as it was. Right and you were faithful and you just kept on keeping on. You talk about so much more in your book, It's Not Over Until You Win. What do you want the takeaway to be for people who read your book? That we don't give up. Yeah. You know, that, you know, and here I am, I'm 88 and a half. I'm having more open doors because I'm an old woman <laughs> with the Islamic <laughs> world because they love old women. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, God. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, why do we give up? Why do we retire? Why don't we refire? Yeah. And so people say to me, when are you going to retire? I said, I am retired. What do you mean? You travel all the time. I said, I know. Retiring is doing what you like. Yes. <laughs> I am doing Having the what I like. That. Yeah. So I'm getting ready uh, to go to some more Muslim countries awesome. and have healing meetings. So. I'm really looking forward to what God has. And I encourage people, don't give up. Don't sit in a rocking chair. Get up. Keep moving. <laughs> Keep moving. Go for it. What does Pat say? Use it or lose it, right? <laughs> exactly. That's right. Why do you think you see so many miracles? Why do I think you see so many miracles that you're, when you say we're going to do some miracle services, why do you think God moves so powerfully? Healing is the bread of the children. Yeah. And Healing, you know, I think sometimes people think, well, I don't have the gift of healing, but the word heals exactly. and healing attracts in Muslim countries and Hindu countries, you know, with people who don't believe in God, with atheists. So healing is not what you feel. Healing is who he is. Mm -hmm. And when you say, come and be healed, and I cover my head and dress like they do, they come and get healed and then they get born again Amen. and we have great follow-up. Listen, there's so much for you to find out about <laughs> Marilyn's life and her ministry in her brand new book. It's called, It's Not Over Until You Win. It's available nationwide. Thank you for what you do. Thank great you for this you. opportunity to share. Wonderful to be here. Can't wait to hear about your next, next escapade. <laughs> well, Lots of fun. <laughs> coming up next, we're gonna be answering questions from you, our viewers, so don't go away. We'll be right back. Well, this Thanksgiving, we are asking you, our partners and our viewers, for a special gift to CBN. Donate an equal amount to what you would normally spend on your Thanksgiving meal. And that way you can spend the holidays knowing that you're helping people both at home and all around the world. 700 Club partners, watch for this mailing. You can send your gift in the envelope provided or send it to Give Thanks CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Our zip code is 23463. You can also call our toll-free number 1-800-700-7000 or visit CBN.com. So lots of options. Your gift to CBN helps to bring life-saving hope to those who need it all year long. So watch for this nice mailing and will you let us hear from you? We say thank you. 
Well, are you ready for some questions? I don't think so, but go <laughs> well, ahead. We're going anyway, so <laughs> buckle your seatbelt. Here we come. Okay. This is Lynn, who says, The women's Bible study I attend seems to be getting off course. I understand everyone has an opinion, but some of them are new age, almost anything goes types of opinions. I think it's up to the leader to get things back on track and biblically condemn these types of opinions, which she doesn't do. Any advice on what I should do is appreciated. Well, Lynn, the number one advice I would give you is please don't condemn somebody for their opinion. That's, that's not uh, going to lead you anywhere. I like to say I, I've never argued anyone into heaven. Uh, what, what you should do is, number one, rejoice. You have people that are gathered together to study the Bible. So they've agreed to do that. And if they have an opinion... Uh, we'll just ask them, well, what do you think about this Bible verse? Uh, we're here to study the Bible. What does the Bible say about that? And get them to ask the, the question about their own opinion. Uh, one of the hardest things to do is to change somebody's opinion. So don't try to do that. Let them do that on their own. What you're supposed to do is be a witness. And what are you supposed to witness? Well, witness the faith and love that is in Christ Jesus. That always works. Uh, whatever doctrine they're pursuing, uh, is it working for them? Uh, what you've got is something that works. Jesus loves to heal. He loves to deliver. He loves to save. He loves to be our answer for every human need. Uh, so bring that to bear uh, and bring that into this Bible study. Don't worry about what the leaders should be doing or not doing. Uh, just be an effective witness. Good answer. <clears throat> this is Bruce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if I wasn't ready, I, I'm doing all right. <laughs> you get a 10. Okay. <laughs> Bruce says, I pray to our Heavenly Father for blessings for my family and friends every day and night. I ask him for guidance throughout the day and night. I ask him for his health, help with my health issue. I thank him for all that he provides for me, but I still have a health issue. Do I ask too much of them? Is there a limit on what I can ask for? Uh, Bruce, don't, don't start listing all the things you're doing. Um, uh, that, that's, that's not going to get you anywhere. Uh, answers to prayer come from belief. God always honors faith. He's looking for that. Uh, and he's right there. And Jesus has already provided the answer to every human need. He's already provided uh, for your healing. So start asking, are you, are you asking a miss? Uh, that's scriptural. Are you asking in accordance with scripture? Um, and prayers for healing are always in accordance with scripture. So you got a yes on that one. And are you asking the right way? If you're saying, God, why won't you heal me? His answer is, well, what part of the cross don't you understand? Uh, so if, if that's it, start praying, Lord, help my unbelief. I, I want to believe. I want to receive what you already have provided for me. Help my unbelief and see if you get a breakthrough from that. It's not about your diligence in prayer. It's about your belief. And so if you have problems believing, get help for that and pray for that. We leave you these words from Psalm 46. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth.